Good afternoon. Welcome to Preservation Connecticut Spring 2023 series talking about preservation. Our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm pleased to be your host today. Today we are chatting with Liz Waitkiss, Executive Director of Docomomo US, I got it. about preserving I moderns and yeah. learning more about their upcoming symposium, The Complexities of the Modern American City, which will be held in New Haven in June. And we may have a special guest, I think Jenny Schofield, National Register Coordinator of the State Historic Preservation Office, will also be joining us. Before we begin, let me give you a brief intro into Preservation Connecticut. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation to preserve, protect, and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. We are statutory partners with the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm proud to say that for over four decades, we have successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all over the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. Our office is on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut, listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's the Eli Whitney Boarding House, shown here, built in 1827 to house workers for Eli Whitney's Armory. It has served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of nine preservation professionals and a board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Staff listed here are always available to assist with inquiries. Chris Christopher Wiegren, our deputy director, contact Chris for information on historic preservation easements, our bi-monthly magazine, Connecticut Preservation News, our Olmsted in Connecticut landscape survey, and to arrange book talks for his book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee Trebert, Making Places and Preservation Services Manager. Please contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial sites and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen is our Development and Special Projects Manager. Jordan manages all of our communications and outreach to members through social media and email receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities and prepares historic, ta historic tax credit applications and nominations to the state and national register of historic places. Kristen Hopewood, development assistant, manages all of the inquiries that come through our websites, provides member services, arranges special events, and is the editor of our historic properties exchange, a free listing of threatened historic properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, Stacey Barrow, and Stefan Danchuk. They provide immediate boots on the ground service to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations, museums, historic, historic districts, and more with an array of preservation technical assistance, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic district designations, funding, and archaeology. These chats have served as a meaningful way to meet our mission, connect with the public, and learn from preservation partners. Please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions or ask questions directly at the end of the presentation. And of course, contact us afterwards for a call or a site visit. And here is uh, registration information for the symposium that we're going to be discussing during this call. And this is the last of our spring series. So if you have any suggestions for topics or presenters for our fall series, please let us know. And so with that, I'm really pleased to welcome Liz from Docomomo. And I'll stop sharing, Liz, so you can share what you'd like to do and take it away. Welcome, Liz. Thanks, Jane. It's really um, fantastic to be here with you all today. Thank you for extending the invitation. I'm just going to bring everything up. Let me know if that looks OK. Perfect. Great. 
Um, so I'll just do a bit of a, an introduction. Um, so I'm Liz Waitekas, the executive director of Docomoma US. Um, before I get into, uh, I'm going to just, I'll talk about the background of the organization, explain our funny name. Um, by that, I don't mean my last name, but Docomomo. Um, uh, and I know some of you here today, and I, I think as we've been organizing the symposium in Connecticut, uh, people have heard me say this over and over again, but I went to undergraduate school at UNH. Um, I wound up spending 12 years in New Haven uh, working at Long Wharf Theater. Um, I was a volunteer at Film Fest New Haven, then I went to work for the film festival. Um, and New Haven is, is sort of my home away from home. I, I, ever since I uh, came to Docomomo um, and we've been running the symposium, um, I have been sort of threatening my friends at the New Haven Preservation Trust that one of these days we need to bring the symposium to New Haven. New Haven is really the reason why I'm at Jokomomo. You could say that uh, I grew up in Albany and uh, I loved, if you've been to Albany, uh, the mall uh, in, New, in Albany uh, by Wallace Harrison had an impact on me, but it was really the years of um, preparing to get my master's in architecture uh, planning to go to Yale. Everyone always assumes I went to Yale, but I went to UNH and I'm very proud of being a UNH alum. Um, and I, I received a, a master's at Pratt in New York City. It took me a very long time to understand that there were other paths in architecture other than being a designer. And uh, once I was at Pratt, I realized that my interest in 20th century architecture was unique uh, to my uh, fellow classmates who just thought this stuff was weird. Um, but it's not weird anymore, right? We all understand that uh, modernism is worthy of preservation. It's as old as I am, um, which I'm not going to tell you how old I am. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely worthy. And now uh, you can see the, the title of this, Pushing Boundaries, and I'll get into that a little bit. But uh, we at Docomomo um, are not a static organization. We are not stuck in the past. We do continue to move that timeline forward. And sometimes we move it backwards even um, as we understand the, you know, fuller history of, of the, the 20th century. So with that, um, so Docomomo, our funny little acronym, uh, stands for the documentation uh, and conservation of building sites and landscapes of the modern movement. Uh, Docomomo uh, is an international organization. Um, so I represent Docomomo US. I'm the executive director of, of uh, the American chapter of Docomomo. And then within Docomomo US, we have uh, regional chapters all over the country. Um, so this is a screenshot of Jokomomo International. Um, I think this page says 77 uh, nation chapters. I will tell you that Jokomomo International also has a conference every two years. Um, and they have a meeting during that international conference of all of the nation chapters. It's so cool because it's kind of like the UN where everybody gets their country name in front of them. And ours, of course, says the United States of America. Um, just, I always just totally geek out when I go to that event. It's really fun. Um, and just an incredible network of people um, to be connected to. And you can travel all over the world and be connected to this network of people who uh, love 20th century architecture. You know, and there are people who are doing preservation and architecture work of, you know, all, um, all types of architecture, uh, all styles, but um, specifically they are interested in modernism, which just makes it for a, a really uh, wonderful group of people. Um, Docomoma International was founded in, uh, God, I'm almost going to forget this, 1988, um, because of the Zona Straal Sanatorium in the Netherlands. Just two, um, two men who were architects who were concerned that this building was 
uh, decaying and there were plans uh, to demolish this. So they got together and said, no one is looking at 20th century architecture as uh, worthy of preservation um, and maybe uh, we should found an organization uh, to, do, uh, to do that work. Here's a picture of Zona Stroll today. I have not seen it uh, uh, fully restored. It's definitely on my bucket list, um, but this is uh, you know, just a, a wonderful testament to uh, the work of the organization. Um, here are our, I believe this is 19 chapters. We have uh, regional chapters and then we have friend organizations. So um, on here you'll see uh, Houston Mod. Uh, Houston Mod is, is not necessarily a Docomomo chapter. It is a organization that already existed and they wanted to connect into our network. Um, so we sometimes like the number of chapters and friends sort of is in flux. Um, but uh, we we really, you know, as a national organization, you know, part of our purpose is really to support efforts locally and broadcast those nationally and and let typically uh, statewide or regional, uh, you know, planning departments or whoever it is that's that's looking at an issue. Uh, know that there, there really is support uh, all across the country, if not all over the world, uh, for the preservation of uh, modern sites. Um, so our organization, Docomomo US, we were officially founded in 1995. That was during uh, the National Park Service has uh, a series of uh, conferences called Preserving the Recent Past. Some of you might remember uh, the very first uh, PRP, as we like to call it, took place in Chicago. Um, PRP3 happened in Los Angeles in 2019. And my understanding is that there will be a PRP4 to take place in Portland, Oregon next year. Um, and I love conferences that other people organize. <laughs> Um, so you can read here, you know, we, we maintain a, a dialogue with uh, a lot of this I, I was just talking about with preservation organizations. Um, you know, we do believe that uh, preservation and creative design go hand in hand, and we're always looking to have that conversation with uh, stakeholders and owners uh, who have projects and are looking uh, at options of uh, reuse. Oops. Um, here is our new mission statement, and this uh, speaks to the, the title today. Um, we just had a strategic planning meeting last year, um, so this is a very new mission statement. Uh, pushing boundaries to preserve modern ar architecture, landscapes, and design through principled advocacy, collaboration, and celebration. If anyone has ever done a, a mission rewrite, you'll know that every single word is important. Um, and, you know, the, the pushing boundaries really speaks to, um, you know, the, the style, the time frame. We get buildings that are 30 years old, 40 years old, or 90 years old. And people are like, is this Jokomomo? Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're not trying to look at just the, the greatest hits of modernism. Um, and that, that phrase, pushing boundaries, is really meant to um, let people know that, uh, yeah, we're, we can be a little pushy. Principled advocacy, um, I am the executive director. We are a small staff. Um, I do lead all of our advocacy efforts. Um, it's usually I'm the person that people reach out to. And, um, you know, the, the work that we do on, uh, for our advocacy, we, we have stakeholders, we have architects who are involved in a lot of these projects. And, and really our role is to, um, you know, be the public voice in these issues and, um, and speak to that and not necessarily, um, you know, the conflicts that may exist, which um, happen in, in here all the time, um, but. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll keep going. Uh, so what does advocacy mean? Uh, and what does modernism mean? Um, modernism for Docomomo is not a time period and it's not a style. 
Um, when we talk about advocacy and preserving modernism, we talk about the innovation of modernism, and that includes these four tenets, social, technical, aesthetics, setting, and context. Um, so just to expand on that a little bit, social, um, this is a, an image, image here of Willard Park Court in Buffalo, New York. This is, uh, I believe, the second purpose-built uh, public housing uh, for Af the African American community, um, it had this, you know, these gorgeous reliefs. It's it's fairly minimal international style. I forget the date of it. Um, I think it's thirty. It's late thirties. Um, but uh, obviously, modernism always had a, a very strong social component in it, um, and we look at that in in all of the the work that we do. Technical technical achievements. This is the the GM uh, dome by Arrow Saarinen and Associates in in, in Michigan. Um, modernism was always pushing those limits of of new technology, new materials, um, and that is 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 a component of what we're looking at. Aesthetics. Um, Kevin Roche. I'm sure everyone in in Connecticut is aware of his legacy. This is the Ford Foundation building in New York City. Aesthetics are what we think of when we think of modernism, but it, it is not uh, the, only, the only tenet of modernism. If you've never been in this building, highly, highly recommend, just beautiful, with the landscapes by uh, Dan Kiley. It's seen a complete uh, restoration um, and it, it did receive a, a Modernism in America Award um, a few years back. And setting in context, this is the, the Weyerhaeuser uh, corporate headquarters. This is uh, SOM with uh, Sasaki um, outside Seattle, uh, Washington. Um, the building is fantastic, but you know what makes this corporate um, campus really interesting is the, the integration of, of, of the landscape. This building is coming out of, you know, the 1960s and the um, environmental movement that had started, the preservation movement, and really trying to incorporate uh, landscape with architecture and not just, you know, pave it all over. Um, this park uh, that the corporate campus is in is free and open to the public. Um, and I, I just mentioned that there, there are more slides at the end that I'll get to if we have time, but this has been an advocacy issue for us because um, there is a developer who wants to take a portion of this landscape and turn it into a speculative, speculative um, uh, what do you call that, like the, the, the shipping, the trucking uh, area, you know, for all of our Amazon stuff that we're buying. Um, so far, that hasn't moved forward, but um, this is an important project for us, um, not just because of the building, but because of the, the setting. So um, back to pushing boundaries, expanding what we protect. This is uh, Kevin Roche, uh, 60 Wall Street, um, this fabulous interior in lower Manhattan. You know, we are really trying to expand uh, uh, what we protect. So when we have a, a project that comes to us or a site that's threatened, um, we are really spending a lot of time trying to look at this and understand it. And there is not a ton of, uh, of research on, um, 80s or even 90s um, architecture and you know is it significant why is it significant um, so we do spend a, a good amount of our time uh, looking looking at uh, what is what does preservation look like in the future uh, so uh, from the iconic you know, the TWA terminal hopefully everyone has gone down there to uh, stay in the new TWA hotel this is actually Dokomoma US's uh, very first major advocacy issue. Um, it predates me by uh, more than a decade, um, but some of you may remember that um, when uh, uh, TWA, and there was an, uh, I think there was another airline in there, um, closed, the Port Authority was proposing to tear, tear the terminal down. It was obsolete almost from the moment that it opened. 
but obviously this is a, an achievement in uh, aesthetics and, and technical achievement by Errol Saarinen, uh, finished by, by Kevin Roche and John Dinkaloo's office. Um, it's wonderful that that has now been uh, repurposed and highly recommend staying there and, and checking out the pool upstairs. Um, to the house next door, um, it's very challenging as national organization um, trying to uh, react to um, important ha houses that are uh, for sale or threatened with demolition. Uh, this is an issue that um, came to us, I believe it was in 20, uh, 2021. This is Marcel Breuer's Geller House. Uh, in Lawrence, New York. So this is on Long Island. Well, it was on Long Island. This house has now been demolished. Um, but we are also, like we are spending more time looking at uh, 80s and 90s projects, we are, we are also um, really trying to take a critical look at how we can be more supportive to local communities um, when they identify um, a significant modern house um, that a developer buys and, you know, the house is underbuilt for the, the land that it's on and um, to give them tools to support them in, uh, you know, educating the local community uh, to try to retain, retain these houses. Um, so just a little bit more uh, about Giacomomo. Um, collaboration as a national organization is super uh, important to us. We do have an online register of significant modern sites, um, communicating, supporting local issues, which I've talked about quite a bit. We do have a, a national theme every year, which I'll get into, and supporting knowledge uh, for better outcomes. Um, so this is, a, this is a screenshot from our website, uh, docomomo-us.org. Uh, we do have a register of uh, significant modern sites all across the country. Um, anyone can add to that. Um, if you have something that you would like for us to add, um, there is a, a, a submission on, on the website. Typically, these are written by our chapters. Um, they're also written when something is endangered. It's not a national register, even though it has the same word. Um, the uh, idea of documentation is that's the first word of our name. Um, so this this is actually a requirement of being a chapter of Jokomomo International is that we do this documentation work. Um, the word uh, register uh, comes directly from them. So it can, there can be some confusion about our register and if there are any protections or how that relates to the national register, um, there is no relation relationship to the National Register of Historic Places. Another resource that's connected to um, the register listings on our website is uh, uh, descriptions of styles of the modern era. Um, you know, within modernism, there are uh, different uh, sub styles. Um, you can see here our deco brutalist. Uh, you know, that brutalist picture is probably from before Hotel Marcel was created. Uh, California modernism. It's a very popular page on our website. It's, I think it's the second most popular page on our website after our front page um, and a great place to just refresh yourself on uh, uh, what, what style is it, right? We all have that book. I don't think any of these styles are in that book though. Uh, supporting regional advocacy. This is a favorite uh, picture uh, of, um, our friends at Docomomo, Wewa, Western Washington State, standing in front of the uh, reactor building on the University of Washington campus. They had a, a love bombing session for this brutalist, beautiful building. Unfortunately, this building uh, no longer exists, um, but the, the locals really did uh, a noble job of trying to save it, uh, going so far as uh, the University of Washington actually sued our Docomomo chapter, um, saying that uh, the university was not subject to, uh, the state university was not subject to uh, local uh, preservation designation. And, uh, you know, that 
was um, a lot uh, to get sued by a university. I, I am very happy to report that uh, we won our, our Seattle chapter won in court. They won in state Supreme Court um, that uh, the state is subject to local uh, local laws. So that is on the books. Um, wonderful win for preservation in general, but certainly the have Jokomomo be mentioned in uh, such an important court case. Um, even though the building is lost, that legacy uh, remains. This is just featuring, we actually, um, we have a newsletter that goes out once a month um, in it. We broadcast uh, events, you know, typical newsletter fair, but we do put in there any of uh, our recent advocacy issues. These are the two that were in the newsletter that went out, I think yesterday. Um, one of them is uh, a corporate campus in, um, uh, they, they call it Chicagoland. Um, it, it's outside Chicago by SOM. Uh, and again, a developer wants to come in and demolish this, this gorgeous campus um, for uh, speculative warehouses. Um, and then the other is, uh, the IAS, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, um, has this beautiful Wallace Harrison uh, designed library, um, and there is a proposal to um, ruin the roof and um, add, add this space frame design to the top of it. Um, so uh, projects like this, we get involved. Typically, we will, will write a letter of support. Um, or a letter directly to the owners telling them that we are concerned. A lot of the strength of our organization is um, through the press. Um, people do not want to hear from me um, because typically the press are watching what we're, what we're looking at um, and things escalate from there. So there is a lot of power in um, Dokomomo just responding to the work that you're doing locally. And I, I will, my, I'll include my um, email at the, uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, feel free to jot it down and uh, reach out to me if there's an issue you think we should weigh in on. I will just say, I am up to here with New Haven Symposium. So give me a couple weeks. <laughs> uh, what else? Okay, national themes. Every year, Dokomoma US creates a theme uh, that we use to uh, inform all of the work we do, including the symposium. We hold a, an event in October every year called Tour Day. Anyone can participate in Tour Day, uh, any organization. Um, in 2020, the theme was the 70s turn 50, right? Like getting everybody all enthusiastic and looking at 70s architecture. Uh, and what we uh, want to preserve. Last year, our theme was um, on malls, shopping malls. Not necessarily to say that all shopping malls are significant, but to put that idea out there that, you know, we're all seeing this issue across the country of what do we want to do with shopping malls? Uh, they are becoming abandoned. Um, how are they being reused? Are some of them significant? Uh, I think, you know, when I think of malls, I think of Hamden Plaza um, and all of that uh, art that uh, some of it still exists. I miss those cars. Um, just getting people interested and in, uh, in thinking about shopping malls. It was a great theme. It, in, it engaged really um, all sorts of people, people who have never really been involved in preservation, right? Everyone has a mall story. Everyone wants to talk about their mall. I have a mall uh, where I'm from in Albany, uh, you know, and I have memories attached to it. And I think, you know, again, that gets, goes back to that pushing boundaries, like not just talking about, not just talking to preservationists, not just talking to architects, really trying to engage the general public with these themes of what do we want to do with our built environment? This year's theme um, does uh, relate to uh, New Haven. The theme is urban renewal. Um, it's a it's a it's a topic that is both good and bad. Um, it it certainly urban renewal had uh, many 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 negative impacts 
Um, but it created some of um, our favorite modern uh, sites. When I think about Urban Renewal, I think about the mall in Albany um, and uh, the, the community that that displaced. Um, it's funny, there was a documentary that was created about the mall in Albany and um, my mom bought me a copy of it and she was like, oh, you're gonna be so excited. There's a documentary about the mall in Albany knowing that I love modernism. The documentary was all about the community that was displaced. And, uh, you know, and I shared that with her, you know, after I watched it and I said this, you know, it's a good reminder of as enthusiastic as I might be as we are um, for the buildings of the modern movement. Um, a lot of people remember what was there before. People are still alive. People were displaced communities were ripped apart. Um, and, and sometimes the communities were part of the process. And I think uh, going back to pushing boundaries, um, we want to talk about the good and the bad. Um, we want to talk we want to talk to the people who were involved and um, and try to try to you know understand uh, how we can include the negative aspects of a design that we perhaps may want to keep. Or is it really out of our hands? We may have a significant design, but um, it's not for Docomomo to decide, it's for the, the community to decide what happens with a, with a project. We have a building um, in Philadelphia, it's a police headquarters and the police have moved out of this building and um, what's gonna happen, I don't know, but I feel like uh, it is, we can inform the conversation about the merits of the architecture, but the decision-making um, should, should at least in that instance, um, be left to, to the community to decide, do we wanna reuse this building? Are there too many negative uh, connections to it? Um, and how do we memorialize, you know, people that might've been, um, uh, you know, harmed uh, in, in such a, a place as a police headquarters building. Um, just so getting back to um, uh, education, this, these are just uh, some great images from our uh, Minnesota chapter uh, doing a road trip. Um, one other project that the Minnesota chapter does really well, and I couldn't find a good graphic for it. Um, they do a program called Going, Going, Gone. Um, they collaborate with realtors. And so when there is a modern house that is for sale, typically Jokomomo um, get the right to have the first tour. It's not a paid tour. And it's really meant to engage our group of people who are crazy about modernism and get them in looking at the house and trying to find the right buyer for the house. Jokomomo doesn't get any proceeds from any sales, um, but I, I think that is, uh, you know, a really good way of dealing with um, individual houses that are for sale and, and trying to put them into the right hands. Uh, better preservation outcomes is a very silly image. This is from our protest at the AT&T building um, in uh, Midtown Manhattan. Um, Philip Johnson, I, honestly, I never thought I was going to be the person who would be associated with preserving postmodernism, but that's indeed what has happened. So you can see um, me with my, um, sorry, <laughs> I do live in New York City, so there are fire trucks that go by from time to time, uh, in my dress and my pearls. Um, and if, if you can see uh, the, the gentleman that's resting his arm on the construction and cradling the building in his arms is uh, Robert A.M. Stern, um, who joined us for that protest. And Bob has really been a wonderful uh, partner for us when we have an issue. Um, I, can, uh, I can email him and he usually is good at responding and uh, supporting supporting us, so it was uh, it was fun to have Bob at the protest. 
Uh, Modernism in America Awards. Um, this is a program we've been running uh, for mm, eight, nine years now, where we, um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, doing the advocacy work, we really want to celebrate uh, the, the great work that people are doing all across the country. Uh, the awards um, acknowledge great design uh, work, like uh, uh, the Yale Whale here, which I think that won an award, the second year uh, that we had it um, for the uh, restoration and the addition of the um, the student areas, the, the locker room areas, I'm forgetting the word. Um, in addition to the design awards that we give away, we give away um, documentation. So that could be a book, it could be a website, uh, it could be a video. Um, we also give away advocacy awards. Um, advocacy could be projects that we're still advocating for. They could be projects even that have been lost and we, we want to uh, find a way of um, using that loss as a teaching tool and, and to not just you know bury the loss. Um, these are a couple of projects that won awards for us last year. You can see uh, there are, at least on this slide, two from Connecticut. Uh, Hotel Marcel won uh, an award of excellence um, last year. That is the featured hotel, as you can imagine, for the symposium coming up uh, in June. And then Gagarin II up in Litchfield. Um, if, if you know Litchfield, it has this fantastic collection of, of modern houses a lot of them uh, by Marcel Breuer. Um, I, I visited Gagarin too when the homeowners first purchased it, um, when it was in a little bit more rough shape and fantastic house. Um, it was interesting when the jury was deliberating on this project, they were having a hard time seeing what changes they made. And it was, it was really great conversation to hear them say, well, isn't that the point, right? that we're not, we're not seeing a heavy hand and that the changes really are harmonious with the original design and really just bringing it back to um, what it originally uh, looked like. Um, sometimes, you know, it takes a, 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 you know, a keen eye to, to know that um, less, less is more, right, with modernism. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the National Symposium in New Haven. Uh, you'll see the dates there, the 21st to the 25th of 2023. Um, it's just a few few weeks away now. We are frantically uh, putting together the final uh, details of the event. Um, we do have uh, five reasons. Every year we create five reasons to join us. Some of these, I think you'll be able to guess. If you want to guess what some of the reasons are to come, you can put them in the chat, but I'm going to go through them here. Um, I missed one. Oh yeah, Modernist Dream. Uh, you might have seen that earlier this year, the New York Times named uh, New Haven one of the 52 places to travel in the entire world. Um, and they included New Haven in part because of the, the reopening of the old Armstrong Rubber Pirelli building by Marcel Breuer, um, but also because of just the wonderful collection of of modern buildings downtown and the really great job that the New Haven Preservation Trust has done to identify and catalog them in addition to the work of uh, Yale University, which um, does a, a, a fantastic job in um, keeping those properties uh, in, in tip top shape. The food is epic. People say to me, you know, why do you go back to New Haven all the time, Liz? Honestly, my friends are there. I have so many friends from living there from 12 years. I have a lot of friends in New York now, but I don't, you know, it's, I go home to eat. I go to New Haven to eat. I mean, pizza, yes. You all know about pizza, but I, I go to eat. There's so much food to eat there. So this is one of the reasons why we're really telling people you got to come. Uh, you know, it's, there is, you know, there's pizza, there's Louis lunch, there's, there's Libby's, um, there's, never ending food sources in New Haven, but you can get into that's easier to get into than that all the pizza. Um, a vibrant art scene, you, you, I'm sure 
everyone on this call has been to the Yale Art Gallery a million times. It never ceases to amaze me that you can walk in and, uh, and see such high uh, quality art um, at the Art Gallery. But there is also uh, Next Haven, which was also featured in the New York Times, uh, 52 Reasons to Go. I haven't been to Next Haven, and that's definitely on my list. Also, the Arts and Ideas Festival. Um, I was there when uh, Arts and Ideas was first created. I think it was in the early aughts. Um, I haven't been back. And I tell you, if you go on our website and go under Don't Miss Connecticut, right under the symposium, there's another line. Um, the Arts and Ideas Festival has given us a list of uh, events that are going to take place the same week as our symposium. I want to go to all of them. I can't because I'm I'm working my event, but I have to not take that for granted. Such a such a great thing to have in New Haven. Sleep in a Breuer icon. I mean, other than TWA, where are you going to like be able to experience? Uh, you know, a project, a, a Marcel Breuer project on, uh, you know, to be able to sleep in it. I, I honestly cannot wait. The rooms are fantastic. They're super quiet, except for these sirens going by my house again. Um, and again, we're, we're telling people to, you know, fly to New Haven. And, and this is, you know, I think one of the main reasons people are going to come. Uh, and the last reason is all your modernism buddies are coming. Uh, Dokomomo is large in scale, but really we are a tight network of, uh, of friends and collaborators. Um, it's not a huge event. It's not 500 people. It's usually between 200, maybe 250. Um, and as I was saying before this call started, uh, one of my friends was trying to convince another friend to come and she said it's actually a really fun event it's not super stuffy like we our our events are creative you know we don't necessarily do them out of a hotel although we are going to be in hotel marcel this year we're not just in you know static spaces we recreate the wheel every time uh we have a new event because we want it to be reflective of the of the community that we're in. Um, and it, yeah, it, it is a, a, a lot of fun. And to entice all of you who I assume are Connecticut residents, um, this year we've received a, an incredible, incredibly generous uh, grant from the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office to offer reduced registration uh, to the first 100 Connecticut residents uh, registration rates are in the three to four hundred dollar range, um, and with this grant from the SHPO, we're able to reduce that to uh, 125. Um, we still have room in there. It gets you into everything except for the tours, and I will say uh, we do have room in some of our tours. We're actually going to announce another tour because we need a little bit more room, but. I would not delay in, in getting one of those tickets and then taking a look at our website and seeing uh, where we have room for tours if you want to do that. But we're going to have opening night reception uh, in the Beinecke. We're going to have a closing reception over at the, um, the British Art Center. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. So I hope, I hope all of you will, will join us. Next year, um, we will announce this officially when we are in New Haven, but our symposium next year will be in Miami, Florida. This is a picture here of Miami Marine Stadium. Uh, this has been an advocacy issue since, ever since I've arrived at Docomomo. We continue to stay on it. Um, we do believe that the state is allocating funds to uh, understand what it's going to take to rehab it, but um, It'll be a lot, it'll be obviously different than New Haven. Um, uh, hopefully some, some sunshine and, uh, and, and a pool. So that are all of my uh, main slides. I see, I'm just looking at the time. We have 15 minutes left, so I am gonna end there. Um, but definitely if you have any questions, if you wanna send me uh, any issues, uh, that is my direct email address. 
Um, I've been a little slow on re replying with the symposium going on, but please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And thank you. Great, thank you so much, Liz. That was a great presentation. Um, like I said in my intro, Jenny Schofield from the SHPO office is joining us. Jenny, did you want to add anything or uh, comment on the support SHPO is giving to the conference? Yeah, I just wanted to add, so um, this is a really unique opportunity for Connecticut to have a national group come and do a conference here that's highlighting uh, Connecticut resources and putting them in the national context. So um, the State Historic Preservation Office has sponsored a, a portion of the conference and just really want to encourage all residents to come, even if you're not a modernist expert or an architecture expert, um, please share that with members of your community that this is a really neat chance um, to, to learn about architecture and urban planning um, and just get some exposure to some really cool people who do design work. Um, so I'll put in that plug, there is still plenty of space. Um, and Liz, uh, I don't think you mentioned that there's also some a la carte options and some student options as well. I'll stop there. Yep, good point. Yeah, the, the student discount is uh, I think $50 gets uh, a student into um, all of the events. I would give it away for free, but we want to make sure that people actually want to come. Um, so yeah, student discounts, we are offering, I believe, every aspect of the event a la carte. We don't always do that, but we know that uh, um, people have a lot of demands on their time. So if you don't want to come to the entire event, uh, you can just Come one night, our, our, we'll have on Wednesday evening, we will have an opening welcome, um, which will talk about uh, urban planning in New Haven uh, with that opening at the Beinecke. And then Wednesday, we will be downtown um, at the uh, School of Architecture. Then we will have a, a plenary closing by Sarah Bronin, which I believe you all know Sarah. Um, she's the new chair of the advisory council. And then fingers crossed, we will have Peppy, Sally's and Modern for lunch back over at the School of Architecture. It'll be super DIY. I need three volunteers to go to three different uh, places. But, um, and then we will be, we have tours in the afternoon and then a reception at uh, Harvest, which is in the basement level of um, British art. But yes, I am pleased. Um, take a look at the registration page of our website and look at the different opportunities for, for participating. Terrific, thank you. So I'll open up the floor for any questions or comments. If you'd like to unmute yourself, go right ahead. There was one question that was presented to us and registration, and I know you commented on Docomomo pushing the boundaries as to you know the era and you know the the architecture that you're working to preserve. But one person wanted to know: Is there a most important year for the modernist movement and architecture that you're preserving that you see that you see? I don't know. I mean, most of our work is uh, post-World War II. Um, I think in terms of years, the thing that is always interesting to me is, is that it's fluid, right? When we're talking about the modern movement, the modern movement, that phrase actually means the interwar period in Europe. And it and it and it's interesting that that is our name. And yet, this international organization recognizes the fact that uh, that though that time frame is different in different places all across the world, and it's different in the United States, right? When we're looking at the timing of buildings on the East Coast, it's different than the timing of buildings on the West Coast. 
And even like the influence, you know, the, the modernism on the East Coast is really influenced by Europe, it's influenced by the Bauhaus, although I, I am not a subscriber to this idea that, that, that the Europeans brought modernism to the United States. It was in fact already going on here. Um, and maybe we influenced them a little bit too. Um, but then you look at the West Coast and you'll see they're influenced by Asia. They're influenced by Japan. And so if there's a year, no, it's, uh, you know, it, it is usually 50s, 60s. Um, I will say, I see uh, Kelvin Dickinson from the Paul Rudolph Institute is here. And he's a, he's a friend and we nerd out over the 70s. I love the 70s. It could be in part because of my age, I don't know. But um, I love seeing new designs that I, I, that I, things that I've never seen before, ideas that I've never seen before, um, combinations of old and new. Uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's how I swallow the postmodernism pill. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, how do you find a buyer for buildings? What are your sources? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, I think just having this network available, making people aware of it, broadcasting to a national audience. Um, I mentioned in the advocacy issues that we have in our newsletter this month, one of them, the Baxter headquarters in Chicagoland. Um, our letter, you can read our letter on our website, you know, says, you know, we hope that the city council will reconsider the proposal um, because corporate campuses can and have been successfully uh, uh, reused in different ways. And one of the examples I gave, and I don't, maybe some of you will cringe, is Union Carbide in Danbury, Connecticut. Um, I, I was out there actually New Year's Day of 2020, um, just randomly a friend and I uh, were like, we were coming up to Connecticut and we wanted like some kind of architecture nerd thing to do. And we we're like, let's go see Union Carbide. And you know, and you go to their website, forget what they're calling that project now, but it's a mixed use community. Um, they're, they've done the same thing with um, uh, uh, Bell Labs, which is now called Bell Works in Homdale, New Jersey, Arrow Saarinen, Kevin Roche Project. Um, but there are, um, you know, I think that it just like, I can't, I don't have buyers, right? I, you know, whether it's a house or, or a Pirelli building, but we have a network. And I think if the network is strong and we get our information out to as far and wide as possible. And by that, I mean, not just talking to the preservation community. I mean, this is something that I, I, I feel very strongly about of, of having programming and being able to speak to people and letting people know that they're, that they're welcome uh, to engage with us. You know, it really needs to be as broad as possible so that maybe there is some developer who is looking for a place to put his money down and uh, someone says, oh, well, they did this here. Maybe, you know, maybe uh, there's an opportunity to do that there. I, I wish I had, I actually told Bruce Becker who did the uh, Hotel Marcel, I'm glad you bought the building because I had been threatening to buy it for many years <laughs> <laughs> and, and live in it. Um, I have another question for you. What has been the hardest architect project to preserve and what has been the easiest? Good question. Um, you know, Philip Johnson's kind of hard. The more you know about Philip Johnson, the more you wish you didn't know. Um, although I will say when I think about AT&T, 
once I understood that project, once I once once the research was done, primarily by me, with with some you know help from some others, it was easy to advocate. I mean, it was easy to be able to advocate for the architecture and understand uh, the precedent that went into uh, the design, what what that office was um, trying to evoke. Some of the connections, like the the marble on the AT and T building, is the same marble of Grand Central Station in New York. And then disconnecting the the name, right? Because buildings are not created by individuals; they're created by many, many, many people. And trying to advocate and and for a design and not a person. Um, I will, in, you know, uh, the the Geller house that we lost was very hard. It was super fast. Uh, you know, I, I I got an email from a board member that was a forward from a professor. It was a professor that overheard a student talking to someone else saying that he was from this town and that this Marcel Breuer building was going to get demolished. And you know, like three or four degrees of separation away, it made its way to me and I started digging in on it. And after you do the research, and again, it really is about, no one had done enough research on that project to understand that the Geller house was the reason why Marcel Breuer was contracted to do House in the Garden at MoMA. House in the Garden at MoMA was the house that is the reason why we have all these modern houses all across the country. I mean, that was the, the show that homeowners went to, individuals, you know, people coming back from war, new families, probably the wives, right? It wasn't the husbands, um, went to the show and said, that's what I want. And the reason why that was there was because this other house had already existed. Um, so once I knew that, once I knew how important that house was, it was not in good condition. And, uh, you know, it had been purchased by a developer. We knew what they wanted to tear it down and put up a bigger house. Um, I, I spoke to the homeowners. They swore to me that they understood and they weren't going to tear it down. And a week later, uh, the Hempstead official um, because Lawrence is a hamlet of, of a larger, a larger city of, of, uh, Hempstead. He calls me up and he says, Liz, he was like, what's the address again? You know, I, I don't see it. And, uh, he said the, the bulldozers are here and it's being knocked down as we speak. It was really hard. It was, you know, we hadn't put it in the press. We kept talking about telling the New York times. Um, but we were really trying to work with the work with the government, work with the homeowners, just say, give us some time. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if I want to say that backfired. We certainly learned a lot from it. I learned a lot from it. It was really hard to lose that one now. And now it's, it's just gone. Yeah, that's tough. The Ambassador Grill is my favorite though. If you've never been to the Ambassador <laughs> Grill in New Haven, it's on 44th and 1st Avenue. It's Kitty Corner from the UN. Uh, it opens at five o'clock for dinner and drinks. If you're in the city, please, 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 please. We designated that. I forget how many years ago, five, six years ago now. It's like stepping into the 1970s. It's, it's so wonderful. It's, it's, it is my happy place. <laughs> I'm adding that to my list. You've given me a lot of places I need to go <laughs> and visit. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you in New Haven in June. And I hope yeah. many of the people here on the call will be there as well. Yeah, please come. Thanks for having me today. And um, yeah, definitely get in touch if there are any issues that we can uh, assist with. Thank you, Liz. And thank you, Jenny. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.